Everybody say the veil. The veil. <clears throat> you know, when you study the history of Israel, and you're going to find out that God gave man first complete presence. When Adam was in the garden, he had the total presence of God 24-7. God was always right there with him. But then he fell into sin, and he lost the presence. The light went out. He was separated by God by a choice that he made. Now that he was cast out of the presence of God and he had to live in this carnal world, even though it was beautiful, had fruit and had all the stuff, it now had work. It done had hardship. It done had pain. It done had sin. It done had destructive forces. Everything was coming against it. Why? Because man was separated from his source. His source was God. God made man. The devil did not. God told the truth to man. The devil did not. When you understand that there are true forces that come against you in life, God will not fight you for his position in your life. He gives you faith. He said, you make the choice. Do you believe me or you don't believe me? I'll honor either one. You want to go to hell? Go to hell. I won't stop you. I don't want you to go there, but I will let you make the decisions for yourself. So we see that God... He always traveled with the children of Israel. He was inside a tent put with a veil around it where the presence of God was always with Israel but not dwelling in them. Can I get an amen? amen. Better amen. amen. See, God was there. God never left them because they were in crisis mode. God didn't leave them. He's right there. They knew behind that veil was the presence of God. So even though they couldn't go behind the veil in fellowship... He was right there with them. How many times have you been in hell in your life? Don't raise your hand. How many times have you been in hell in your life, and all, but you knew God was still right there? You could feel him. It, it's like something invisible, but he was there. I mean, he's always been in my life, but he was not the forefront of my life. But he was always there. You see, when you start realizing that there was something that had to be done so that God could bring that position back where man could have fellowship with God and be in the same place with him. You see, if you talk about the presence of God defined in the Hebrew, it meant face, intimacy, countenance, or favor. So the very presence of God is intimacy. God created you for his good pleasure. It was pleasing to God to have fellowship with us. But because of sin, we feel, how could God love us anymore? Look at the mess we've made with our life. Look at our life. And see, your focus is not on God, it's on yourself. And you're looking at poor little over you and what you've got wrong with you, and you're forgetting that God knows you're a screw-up, but he made a way of escape. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will dwell with you forever. In fact, he said, he is with you, but he shall be in you. Meaning the presence was with the children of Israel, but he wasn't in them. And that's what Jesus came to do, was bring that intimacy to bring us back, not just with him, but in him. You have Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you wherever you go. No matter what circumstances try to dictate, God says something about that relationship. Webster's Dictionary says that, that presence means the state or fact of being present. A supernatural influence felt to be close at hand. When you feel the presence of God, start talking to him. Amen. Don't fear him and run away. That's what a carnal mind will do. But you run to God and say, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I'm mad. I keep making mistakes. God, I'm so sorry. And he goes, thank you for coming and talking to me instead of running from me. See, fear is of the devil. It tries to separate us from the very source that we need for our life to make it. I told my daughter the other day, I said, look, the Bible says in Hebrews, he said, the very, it says, lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets you. You know what that weight is? Holy Ghost showed me. That weight is you trying to take care of you. You keep piling all this stuff on your do's and your don'ts, your rights and your wrongs, and man, God, would you help me this? I, I just feel like I'm just a mess. I feel like I'm, and you're trying to con God. He said, why don't you just take that weight and pitch it over on me? Why don't you take 1 Peter 5, 7, when I said, cast the whole of your cares upon me because I care for you. 
Why don't you throw it over on me? Then we can deal with that sin. That sin is what separates you from me and doing my will. Satan will show you where you're messing up and say God wouldn't accept and use you. And you've got to deal with that sin, but you can't do it unless you get rid of the weight. You've got to cast that weight and say, I'm not carrying me anymore. God never intended for you and me to take care of ourselves. You try to take care of you and you are a mess. But if you let God take care of you, you're going to shine. Because why? He is tenderhearted. He's loving. He's compassionate. Can I get an amen? See, John 15, 7. Jesus said, If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified. Do you realize that he's saying, if, if, if something gets inside you, is that intimate? When a man marries a woman, and they go through all the virtuous vows and everything up the front, that's cool. Then he says, and now I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss. You may be intimate with your wife. And he lifts the veil. And he looks on that pretty face. And he kisses her. Publicly stating intimacy is now legal. I have a legal right to be intimate. When you got born again and received the Holy Spirit into your life, God said, now I am as intimate to you as a man is with his wife. Never neglect the intimacy that God has supplied. Let him love you. Let him speak for you. Let him talk to you. Let him come in and give you everything he wants to give you. Can I get an amen? amen. The word intimate defined means marked by close association. Marked by privacy and informality, very personal, like a close friend. You know, there's a lot of people you meet in public, you shake their head, go, hi, how you doing? But there's others you go, hey, how you doing, Katie? Praise God, I've known you since you were that tall. See, all of a sudden there's an intimacy. There's, a, there's something that time has brought something together that's special. And that's what God wants with you. He said, look, I know you were torn away from me by sin. I know you got away from me. But would you walk in my presence? Please, take your dirty clothes and throw them down. Get naked before me. Come into my presence. I'm not ashamed of you. I won't throw you out. See, if you went before God right now, the angel would say, take all your clothes off and then go in and see the Lord. And you'd freak out. Oh, God, I can't. Oh, I can't. Oh, my God. God says, I created you. You don't think I don't know everything about you? You've got a figment in your imagination that thinks deep, 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 God really, really, really doesn't love me. I mean, I know it's a good thought, it's great thought, but, but really, 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 if he knew the, the thing in me, God said there ain't nothing that he don't know about you. But he made a decision. I'm going to rent the veil, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to prevail for you. Do you know this whole thing was done for you? God did it for you. Say, God did it for me. For you, and if you don't make it personal, it won't be. Satan will come into all the stuff in this world and try to knock that off. See, there's three ingredients that always hurt us that will attack you. When, you. when Jesus rent that veil, did he rent it? Yes. Was it torn? Did, it, did the, yes. the partition between God and man, was it gone? Yes. Then what puts it back? The three veils that were closed to you and the presence of God opened to you forever, eternally. It's the, the veil of the world, the veil of the flesh, and the veil of the law. Those doors are closed to you and me. That's why Jesus said, come out from amongst the world. Be a separate and holy people. He wouldn't say, get on a rocket ship and fly away somewhere to another planet. He was talking about this world system. This world system is a con manipulated system. Satan told Jesus himself, you see these kingdoms out here? All these are mine. If you'll get down and worship me, I'll make you ruler of them. He said, get behind me, Satan. It is written, you will worship the Lord thy God and him alone will you learn. Do you know that Satan had the legal right to offer Jesus everything this world had? 
all its goods, everything. Because he set the world system up. He's the one that got it all going. And that's why people put value on things and they rip people off and then they change the value of it later and it's worthless. And they buy it back cheap and then later they crane the system again and make all this money off of people. That's not godly. It's a worldly system. It's motivated by lust. Everything that the world system is generated by is lust. Everybody say lust. Lust, lust is a desire to satisfy yourself at the expense of others. Love is always a desire to satisfy others at the expense of self. I love it. That man come up and like my hat. I was in this place today, he goes, man, I like that hat. Where do you get one? Right here. I stuck it on his head. I said, it's yours now. Oh, I can't take it. I said, yes, you can. You can insult me. How dare you do that to me? He goes, well, thank you. I like that hat. And I've gave away a dozen hats. Every time I see someone, they go, oh, I love that hat. I go, oh, Lord's telling me to give it to them. Why? Because it's exciting to break the rules of the world. The world says you better give it and keep it for yourself. God says you better give it away or you're going to have nothing. See, it's a world versus God. And you've got to understand. Look, you know what's so bad about the world system? Everything was given to us in this world to enjoy. But only one person wants to give it to you. And what's his name? Jesus. See? Everybody say it. Jesus wants to give you all the finer things in this world. He just doesn't want you going to the world and getting it from them. Hey, brother, you got a good job. You got good money. Let's fix you up. Here's 27 credit cards. Hey, come on, boy. We love you, man. We want to take care of you. So you're so strapped and riddled in debt and you can't see straight. Then the world says, says oh, you got something wrong with your body. Here, take these 37 doses of pills of all kinds. And pretty soon you got pills to take care of the damage the pills are doing. It's a world system, folks. It's a world system. God said, come out from amongst the world. Put your trust and your faith and confidence in me. I got a good brother right now. His wife, they, she's got bone cancer, brain cancer, uh, lung cancer, and, uh, 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 and breast cancer. She got all of them. Doctor said, bye. Nothing more we can do for you. So guess what? We still got to put our trust in the Lord. Everything in God is yea and amen, not oh me. When I saw John, when I saw uh, Exodus 15, 27, and he said, if you will hearken unto my commandments and obey my statutes, I will put none of the plagues that were upon Egypt upon you. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now, he went in Proverbs 4, 4, uh, 4, 20 through 24, and he said, If you will attend to my word, keep it in the midst of thine eyes and in thy heart, out of it flow the issues of life. He said, My word is life and health to all them that find it. You know what the word in Hebrew, in, that, in Proverbs 4, 20 through 24, that word health, it's the word medicine. So if you took 15, 26 in Exodus, and you take this one here in Proverbs 4, 20 through 24, he says, I, the Lord that healeth thee, will do it with the medicine that I have for you. You know, God knows how to fix you. Amen. He is a God who heals and delivers. But yet the world system says, you need a psychiatrist. I had a lady I was praying for up in the hospital in Houston, and she said the doctors came in, and, and she got born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, and God healed her, took all the parasites out of her colon, and they, weren't, they were going to cut a fourth of her colon out. And then they come back and said, well, I don't know what happened from yesterday to today. We couldn't find any parasites, so we're going to just send you home. That was over a year ago. Her liver's starting to work again. She's got her carb license back. She could drive again. You don't listen to me, guys. She didn't go to church anymore. Her family's totally against this healing stuff. Thinks she's lost her mind. They told the doctor about it. When she went back in the hospital and had some checkup, they sent a psychiatrist in there and wanted to talk to her. Uh, are you depressive? Are you thinking about suicidal thoughts? Are you doing anything like that? No, no, I feel great. What's wrong? Well, we hear your family's talking about you talk too much about God and healing and stuff like that and we know that God sent doctors to help people with that problem she goes sir 
my faith is in Jesus Christ. And I don't need no drugs to make me feel anti-depressed. I'm not depressed. I'm not depressed. See, you'll not put psychological words or terms inside me to make me psychologically think about them that I need the world system to make me fix. I don't. I need faith in Jesus Christ alone. In Him we live and move and have our being. You don't think if He say that, we can't live inside Him, that He will not take care of us? He said, I'll abide with you forever. And if my word abides in you, guess what? you got something good working your way. Can I get an amen? See, when you see the separation because of the veil, the temple veil separated the holy place from the most holy place or the holiest of holies. The temple veil was torn at the time of the crucifixion to signify that all men could now have free access to God. Jew and Gentile. I'm telling you what, when Jesus rose from the dead, he said, listen to me, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no barbarian, Scythian, there's no male or female, there's no bond or free. There's me and them or an absence of me in them. God doesn't look and judge a respecter of person. He says, I died for all. If my children would have done what I told them to do, they'd have been bringing all the heathen world into the kingdom of Jehovah, and then all of a sudden Messiah would have come and got them all. But they didn't do it. He came anyway and said, I did it. It's done. Well, the Jews, I don't care what they're doing. It's done. Their Messiah has already come. They'll see him again one day, that remnant that God loves and will stay by them. But you and I have got to understand, we don't hate anybody. We walk in the covenant of love and blessing. The only commandment we have is to love one another. Can I get an amen? amen. See, the veil was torn. The temple veil. This is the greatest factor for Israel was that Jehovah was there a presence that was waiting behind the veil. Ephesians 3.12 if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall say, ask what you will, and that's not it. Ephesians 3.12. He said, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. You see, free access is without fear. It freely means at will and without cost to us. Look, it costs God everything to give you his presence back. And how would we insult him to think that we would earn or deserve it? Hello? He moved the veil and said, I don't come with what you've done wrong to say that's why you have to humble yourself because you're not right. What you just did is told me that what I did didn't fix you. Right is right. Am I right? I'm right. I'm right. Am I right? I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. You see, that's what God said. He said, look, I'm right. I didn't lie. I didn't make a mistake. I chose you. You didn't choose me. Why don't you follow me? Why don't you lift up my name? Why don't you lift and exalt me for who I am in your life, even though you don't feel like it? Just to live by faith, not feeling. Feelings are lies. They're based on something other than God. See, there is nothing on God's side to prevent us from living in his glorious presence. Satan stacks all your flesh and all your worldly things against you and says, oh yeah, what about all this? That's coming from you, devil. You can't put nothing between me and God. He rent that veil. If he brought me into his presence, then why don't I just live it? Well, my senses, I don't care what your senses say. Change the way you feel. And the way you'll do that is by saying what he say. If his word abides in you, if you start growing, I'm a son of God. He's the glory and the lifter of my head. He's the author and finisher of my faith. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will satisfy my soul upon him. Wow. If you would hear what he's saying, then you could possess what he says. If you don't hear it, then you go, go on. I don't know that. But you'll never do nothing with it. You'll never possess it. You'll never understand God's love for you. See, the veil of the world. We've got to look at that thing in Galatians 6.14. Galatians 
Revelation 6.14. We're not there? I'll get on mine. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the... Listen to me, folks. The world is your enemy. It is not your friend. It never will be. Not in this, perfect, this imperfect world we live in right now. Because why? Satan wants you to glorify him. Oh, God, I thank you for my business. I'm a multimillionaire because of my business. No, you're not. You're a multimillionaire because God loves you and he gave you a way to benefit your life, to benefit others. But if you look at it, it's what you did learning how to manipulate the world system. That's exactly what Satan wants. Give me the glory. Pat yourself on the back. What a great person you are. No. No. I've got to look at what Paul said. He said, get out from amongst the world. Do not let it. Paul said, I was crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to me. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. I truly put these in here before church. I don't know. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Is there not a power in owning things? Does it not make you now have to have a responsibility that others don't have? Man, I got five houses in five different locations, man. I've got all this money in the banks and CDs and money marks and dividends and all that. And the more you got, the more it controls you. What, what do I do with this? Now? Oh, I gotta be, no, no, I can't just do that. No, we got to go do that. No, we got business meetings. So we got, the richer you get, the more enslaved you become. People think, oh, if I just was a multimillionaire, I'd be free. No, you're not. You'd be in so much bondage, you wouldn't know how to do it. Because there'd be business meetings. Well, you sir, your money's here. Everybody wants your money. The world system sees you got it. They'll just manipulate you to get put in this pocket where they know they're going to gain way more off of it that you don't know about. I saw one lady, the Partridge family, that woman got on. She said that this E.F. Hutton ripped her off for over $4 million because they had an Asian guy that was knowing how to mick it, nick it, nick it, nick it, and vest in somebody else's offshore thing and pop it back, and he was just ripping all her money off. She sued him and got her money back. The world system is corrupt. It, you got money? They know you got it? Hey, friend. You're my friend. Hey, we're going to send a plane to pick you up, take you down to Las Vegas, have a great time, put you up in a $50,000 a day hotel, but we're going to put $1 million of that money you got in your bank into our bank. It's all, folks, the world is a liar, and it is not your friend, and it never will be. you got to be aware of that. you got to guard your heart against that. Colossians 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are from where? Above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Father, or of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Do you realize, people, that one day we're going to be dead in this body and we're going to wake up in glory? And he's not going to look at you and say, oh, Mike, you're just an old sorry fireman. You really didn't do much. No, he'll not have one negative thing to say about any of us. He'll say, get over here, son. Get over here, daughter. And I've been waiting for this moment that we could be face to face again. But the religions have kicked people in the face that God really doesn't like you. You got to do more to please him. No, Jesus didn't do anything to please his father but obey him. And he said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. He hadn't done anything yet. And God said, I am well pleased. How much do we have to do to please him? Nothing. We have to just accept how much he's madly in love with us that he let his own son die so that we could have relationship with him again. See, Paul had no addictions. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. 
For as far as the world is concerned, you are dead and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. What do you have your mind on? Is it on selfish pleasures and things that you get and what you get out of it? Or is your mind fixed on somebody meeting this benevolent and wonderful God that lives inside you? See, it's where we put our value. Psalms 37, 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and the secret petitions of your heart. God wants you to know, I will give you what you want. Don't go toot your horn about it, just ask me. And I will give, grant you the desires of your heart. Romans 12, 2, he says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, Satan wants to conform you to the system of which he is the God or the Prince of. And you can't do that. He said, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscences, and covetousness which are idolatry. Idleness is where you set yourself on the throne of your own heart and you say, I'm going to do it my way. I want heaven when I get there, but I don't want to do anything God says. I just want my way. When I feel I'm pleased, and I know God should be happy because I'm pleased. <laughs> That's perverted. God wants you to know how much he loves you and he will bless you, but all the glory will go to him. Nothing you did to get it. I mean, I just shared with a man, Jesus, and just enjoyed laughing and talking about the Lord, and he gave me $500 to put in the church. I, I want to give it back to him. I said, no, look, you got, see, why? I don't do it for that. I do it because I love Jesus, and I love to give him to somebody. It's hard sometimes to receive blessings from others that are outside the church because they want to help me more than some people in the church. You fish and try to keep people moving the right direction, they're going, well, what's he really after? Ah, I'm after you to change, to be an image to Christ out in this world that someone's going to say, what's, what's in that guy, man, or that woman? Man, they're different. You're right, we are. We're unique. Can I get an amen? amen. Satan tempts and lures with the world. Luke 4, verse 5 through 8. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. You see, God's let us know. You can get a position by playing up to the right people through pretense, lying, dishonesty. Many must sin against their own hearts to keep their job. This equals worship of Satan because we are bowing down to his system, his way of doing or being. Jesus said, I am the way. I was talking to Pastor Kirby the other day and... and uh, he left his job for that very reason. And he'd been at that place making good money. New, new management came in. A heathen guy raging over him, getting in his face, telling him, this is the way it's going to be. I'm going to take half your bonus, half your this and that. You're going to do this and that, and you're going to like it. He said, no, I'm not going to like it. He started looking for another job. He came back in there and gave him his resignation. He said, whoa, 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 wait, no, 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 no. We don't want you to go here. We'll, we'll keep your old pay plans like it was, and we'll do this and that. And he goes, no, sir. You have threatened my integrity. You have tried to drag me under the bus. So you live with the consequence. But I'm leaving. And he went to another company. He had two offers just like that. And he went to work for another company. Why? God is Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. But don't ever sacrifice. Well, I've got to do what they say. You know, it's my job. Not if it causes your conscience to be victimized. Something comes against you and says you're going to sin or you're going to be out of here. Goodbye. I will not do it. Not now, not ever. See, Satan's after worship. John 4, 23.
John 4, 23. He said, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, the most important thing that you understand, worship is something you pay homage to. And Jesus said, you pay homage to no man. You pay it to God alone. And if anybody puts themselves on some kind of pinnacle and they think, you'll do well, or I control you, I'll, mm -mm, no, you don't. You won't have my worship. That's idolatry for me. When I left that car dealership, I told them, you know, guys, you're right. I'm no car salesman. I'm a preacher. And I'll never bow, nor bend, to the scrutiny that you put people under in this place. I pray for your souls that you get delivered from it. Well, you need to go preach. You ain't no car salesman. You're right. God bless you, man. Have a good life. The other guy said, well, at least your work ethics were, were admirable. You really did a great job. Even my enemy praised me. Why? Truth is truth, folks. When you meet someone that that's a solidarity fact inside their life, it don't matter what they think of you. It don't matter if you messed up. It don't matter if you failed in any of your life. You say, God, I'm sorry. And he says, okay, I forgive you. Get up. Let's go. You're just as righteous as you were before you did it. The world doesn't, don't let the world put you under their eye. And say, now, let me just wait a minute. You do. Have a good life, sir. I'll see you later. I'm gone. You don't judge me. Only Christ judges me. See, Christians have got to get to that place where we get back into that and say, God, there is a battle for our worship. When you come in here, I want to see hands up and praising God and worshiping Him, not sitting there and saying, well, is the song's good and everything, this and that. No, you need to say, this is my opportunity to gather together and assemble and worship the living God. Worship Him myself. I want it recorded on this Sunday. I was in church worshiping God. If you're out of town somewhere else, go worship God in a place up there. Put God always first in your life. And he will put you first in his. He will be the glory and the lift of your head. Why? God furthers the kingdom through smiles that come through trials. We see that a lot of times it's the love of money that causes men to fall short. 1 Timothy 6.10 He said, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Money is, it, it, it's a tool. It's something that we all need. I, I can't go down to the service station and put the thing in my tank. Thank you, Lord God, for gas going to come to the pump. No, I'm going to check my wallet, get the credit card out. I'm going to stick it in there and get me some gas. So we don't get fruit flaked and nutty, but we got to understand that that didn't put the gas in my tank. God gave me the money from his spirit that got me into the place that I did with his will requested of me, and then he benefited me. See, our lives are always attributing God to the success that we have in our life. To God be the glory for great things he's done in my life. It's always got to be that way. So... Sometimes the love, we love people and use money to bless them. But we do not use people and love money. Don't use people to get to more money. Don't form an insecure relationship because you are using the person to get something you want. I've told people in this church, I disagree with you. I don't like that. And they've left me. They, they don't go there anymore. Didn't mean I didn't love them. I just disagreed on their doctrine. Look, there's a place where you lead people. Guess what? Not everybody's going to follow. Sometimes they're going to say, and I think that's good. God will always cull the crop and let those who go when they need to go and those that stay that need to stay. It's all about his kingdom. It's not about mine. Sometimes you say, oh, God, I wish everybody that made millions of dollars would come to church with us and bless us. And God says, what's wrong with you being blessed with what you have? Are you not content? You're not happy with what you got? That's the way I'll increase you. 
But if you're looking across the border, what they got over there, then pretty soon you try to copy what they're doing over there. Then you're not me anymore. You're working off your intellect, starting to see what they do. So you'll implement what they do so you can get what they got. It sounds like lust. doesn't sound like love. See, when I was going to Bible school, I was teaching them the Bible school, I said, God, it's so neat to have so many students that are clapping when you get through preaching. And, Man, they're so hot. They're going, yo, this is great. I said, God, how come I can't have that in my church? He goes, James, he said, the school is for you. The church is for me. Thank you for loving my people. Oh, why not you put it that way, Lord? Oh, okay. See, sometimes you can forget. I got the biggest and the finest congregation on planet Earth because you're here. It's not what you're worth or the value of even your future. It's you yourself that you were created by God and he loves you and he trusts me to minister to you for him. That's where the motive is. That's what you've got to see. John Osteen, I love John Osteen because I watched him when he walked with people. He walked in that church of 4,000 people and little old short little fellow man, skinny little old guy ran down to there and everybody's hugging him and loving him. Every common person could run up there and grab him and hug him and he had to get to the stage. But he never saw himself more important than them. And I said, God, make me like that. Status quo won't put you in the know. You need to have that relationship further than your own life that yours is important to God. Where you're at, wherever you are, that is what's most important. And that's what God's trying to get across to us. And he said the world system is trying to take that away from you. See, He's trying to rip you out, and you've got to say, no, you can't do that. Mark 4, 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things enters in. Choke the word and it becomes unprofitable. Now what did Jesus say? He said it choked the what? The word. And the word became unprofitable. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust thereof choke the word and make it not profitable for you. God said, remember if my word abides in you, takes up residence in you. If you heard me and you know the conversation was between me and you and you took it personally and you put it in your heart, then guess what? That word would abide in you and all of a sudden it would become you. And therefore what benefit came from that is because the Lord willed you to have benefit. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. There's nothing poor about God. God wants you to be blessed, healthy, wise, strong, courageous, bold. God doesn't want you to say, oh God, I'm so scared. No, he doesn't. He wants you to say... Thank you, Lord, that you abide with me forever. 1 John 2.15. 1 John 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world... The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. God wants you to be stimulated and motivated by his word that all of a sudden it transforms you into his word. And when he said that great scripture in John 1, 12, for as many as are led by the Spirit, he gave power to be called the sons of God, that were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. And then it said in verse 12, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you realize that you are the word made flesh dwelling amongst men and women? Every time the word occupies you and you won't let go of it and you meditate on it and you ponder on it and then you let it become real in you, first the bud, then the ear, then a full ear of corn, all of a sudden five years from now, 
I can talk about prison. I can talk about drug addiction. I can talk about all that stuff. But that was over 33 years ago. In fact, it was over 40 years ago since I ever had any kind of trouble with the law. 40. Why? Because Jesus came in and transformed me. You, you was, but you're not anymore. You are what he says you are. And that's when you take that to heart. See, if you love the things of the world, they're passing away. Worldliness and the spirit of, is the spirit of Antichrist. We've got to recognize that Satan wants to control and manipulate us, and he uses it by things that we're easily distracted by, things that we care about, things that we put value to. Man, I'm, I used to just get all rocked out over basketball games and stuff and go, oh, my team's winning. Now I get, so what? They're not sending me a check. <laughs> they don't care if I even turn it on or not. My emotions are the ones that are getting all that. Why? Because you draw something from it that makes you look bigger than you are. My team won. So, 20 years from now, it ain't going to make no difference. You won't even remember who they were. But God said, seek the things which are above. Keep your focus on those things that God has for you. And all of a sudden, you're going to see the abundance of his reign on your parade. Can I get an amen? God wants us to walk upright before him. And he wants us to know that we have the world that's in our way, and then we have our flesh that's in the way. Everybody say flesh. See, that veil of the flesh is a terrible thing. Without Christ as the center of our lives, we will be filled with things do not let things push him off his throne, your heart. Take off the veil of the world and enter into the fullness of his presence. See, the Bible says that no flesh shall glory in God's presence. 1 Corinthians 1.29 That no flesh should glory in his presence. He purposely chooses people who will make mistakes who have weaknesses and inabilities, and those who will have to lean on him. Oh, Brother James, I'm just, you know, I'm just such a mess. Isn't that wonderful? Say, I'm a mess. And God don't care. He loves me anyway. You ain't got an excuse that you can come to God and say, well, God, I'm just such a mess. He goes, well, what do you want to do about it? Do you want to brag on it, or do you want to get rid of it? It's your choice. I won't make it. You won't manipulate me. I'm not going to say, oh, bless their heart. God's mer his, his emotions aren't in this game. He says, everything in me is yay and amen. If I tell you something, I'm not, I'm not crying. Oh, please don't do that. Oh, I just beg you don't do that. He said, I told you. You want to do it? Do it. But you will have a recompense from your error. Can I get an amen? amen? See, in Genesis 17, 11, we saw that when God was setting up the covenant, he said, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. To circumcise means to cut off. God was saying that's going to be very painful. That's why a father had to circumcise his son on the eighth day. He had to do it. You had to get that hard rock and grab that little thing and go, yeah! kids screaming and going crazy. And then he had to take, the law required, he had to take care of him until he was well. You think, this pain, my God. But the father had to endure the pain with him and stand by him and give him his courage and his strength. And then that day he came at his 12th birthday and he put him up before Abraham's, uh, the whole nation of Israel and they brought the kid up before the elders of the city and said today my son is a circumcised son of Abraham and all the adults and they hugged him and oh, he was going mm, cool man pain's gone glory's come identity came through the cutting he had to deny his own fleshly pleasures and stuff in this world and accept the God over that if not he wouldn't have been a good son of Abraham you know, you stand up sometimes and, 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 and a prostitute come and say, here, baby, come on. Let's have some fun. Not today, not ever. I'm a man of God. I'm married to a woman of God. And I have children of God. So you take your hell back to hell with you. I don't want it. But there's many carnal Christians that go, well, I just got a little weak, you know. No, you really didn't take your covenant serious. 
you wouldn't study the Word of God. The Bible said that, the, the, that, that God said, you hide the Word in your heart that you may not sin against Him. I used to think, man, you know what? Man, don't look pretty well. They go, oh, that's, that's a hot little chick right there. All of a sudden, I see Proverbs 30. Huh? Oh, she stood at the city gate and said, oh, come lie with me. My husband's out of town. He's gone on a long journey, man. Come. I got lilac and honey in the bed. Said the poor idiot went in and slept. And he said his soul was trapped in hell. And under the bed were the bones of dead men. Every time some pretty woman talks to me like that, I go, oh, oh, oh I see them bones. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Why? Because God's word says, uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not for you. See? Don't ever get your macho up, Mo. I'm some hot tiddly do. No, you will be piddling on the wrong side of the doodle. <laughs> and you will make a mess that you will wish to God you weren't even born. Too many people have fallen short because they answered the call of their flesh instead of the call of God. See, the Old Testament ceremony of circumcision is a shadow and a type of the new command to circumcise fleshly ways, attitudes, hearts, and minds. Colossians 3, 1 through 5. Colossians 3, 1 through 5. Oh, did we? Okay. Galatians 2, 20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, he said, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, my flesh I don't live by. It's not my temptations of the flesh that want me to please me. I'm saying I usurp my own authority over myself and I place it with the authority of Jesus Christ. And I say, Lord, if this ain't pleasing to you, remove it from me. I know it was a lot of fun. I know I enjoyed that. See, no longer what I want, what I feel, what I think. Hebrews 9, 8. He said, the Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks, and divers washings, and carnal ordinances, imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. What kind of redemption? For us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling with unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See, you've got to have the mind of God in it. He said, I fixed you. Don't sit there and serve your carnal man. Serve your spirit man. If I made you right with me, you are? You are? See, if you are right, then you are right. Then live like you're right. Act like you're right. Walk like you're right. Not based on if you do wrong, but based on he said you are right. The only way you're going to stop serving your flesh is to start serving him. That you say... Look, I got, I got some place I want to go. I, 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 all right, Lord, forget it. I'm going to go do this. Because that's more important than your flesh going, come on, you're going to be late. You're going to miss the kickoff. You're going to do that. Shut up, flesh. I don't serve you.
Matthew 16, 21. From the time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto him, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things of that are of God, but those things that are of men. Look, flesh honors flesh. Anybody sitting in the back of a room and someone brings you up to the front and sits you down, you hear, woo-woo. Something about your flesh getting a little glorified, man, over somebody else's. You go, oh, wow. And God says, that's the biggest danger that you ever walk in. Don't seek position. Seek the possessor of heaven and earth. Walk with him, and God will promote you. God will always promote you. Because he sees your hearts right and he can trust you. See, one cannot mind their flesh and walk in the spirit. Your spirit's going to tell you one thing. Your flesh's going to tell you another. And you're going to have to tell your flesh to shut up. I'm going to do what God said. Romans 8, 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Everybody say, I, in my flesh, I can't please God. But why do I keep telling myself I can a lot of times we will substitute just saying, God, you got to kill me every day so I can become more alive to you. That means if not, I'm going to create this guy that I really like and I'm going to get around others that like like I like. And pretty soon we're all led by what we like, Amen. not by what he said. See, when you cater to something, you'll start serving it. Choose whom you'll serve. We die to the flesh, and the flesh does not die to us. Look, if I say, let's get rid of the flesh, and I pull out a gun and start, okay, who's ready? Well, that wouldn't do nothing. Our flesh is not going to die for us to die. He's saying, you must willfully tell yourself, I obey God. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If those people in my house don't want to serve the Lord, I'm going to go serve the Lord. Leadership always requires something of those that follow. If you're not obedient and, and follow God, then don't expect to see great rainbows of glorious things happening in your life because you won't put yourself into participation with what God's revealing. God's loved you, wanting to just bless you and do everything for you, but he's got to make you understand the flesh can't please him. Romans 6, 1 through 13, it shows repeatedly that we are legally and positionally dead to sin. Experientially, we must consider and see the way that's right. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as are baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There should be something inside you that the Creator has put in you that desires to be more like Jesus. If not, it doesn't mean you're not more like Jesus. It means you've got distractions. You've got the cares of this world. You've got the deceitfulness of riches. You've got the lust thereof. You've got problems in your family, problems in your children, problem on your job, problem with your finances, problem, problem, problem. And he said, hello, I'm Jehovah Jireh. I will provide for you. If you trust me, but God, you just don't know what, oh, I guess I lost my brain that day. I, God knows everything. There's not one thing that we can say that God don't know. You, you can't lie to God. He'll expose you. Can I get an amen? See, we have to bring ourselves to yield our faculties and bodily members to God. The mind is extremely important. We cannot think sinful things things and walk in holiness. I can't be flicking a TV set on there's a girl in a hooli gooly doing some crazy stuff on her and I'm going, oh check it out man. <laughs> what are you checking it out for? There ain't nothing for you there. <laughs> but yet, oh that's just my flesh kicking up. Well kick your flesh. Click that button and get it off the TV set. See, I'm telling you, 
when you start walking in holiness with God, you start examining things that you're watching, and if it ain't good for God to look at, it ain't good for you to look at. There's all kinds of, I do not watch commercials anymore that comes on that TV says, you know, your feet hurt, you, you know, I'm, I'm, a di I'm a diabetic, I got this, I, 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 I do not need your report. I do not need you to tell me what I need to get, a psychosomatic thing going in my brain that pretty soon, you know, I do feel kind of tingling in my feet. I mean, you know, I better go to Dr. Zeus and see if he gives me some kind of pills to take for it. And they did say that drug. That's a trillion dollar drug industry. You think they give a rip about you? When they came out with Viagra to help all the men out. Bless their little hearts. I want to give them a fresh start. They, this is no lie. 30, they, they, there's, I think they said there's, it's $10 a pill and it was three bills to a prescription. They said they sold over a million prescriptions the first year it came out at $30 a prescription. That's $30 million. It's off the chart. We got no libido problem in this country. I mean, that's everything you do. Take this one, take that one. They got competition going on. That no, you got blood pressure, heart attack, go blind. You can. Who cares? Whee! People are going nuts, man. They're following their flesh, and if the flesh says do it, they don't understand nothing about a kingdom they're fixing to go to. I'd sometimes, oh, you know, well, you know, oh, uh, I, all these people I know, they love God. They don't ever go to church. They never pray. You never hear them say anything about good, but they might do some good things. Folks, the word is entrance to light. It reveals what's in your heart. You can't lie to God. You can lie to people all day long. I'm a good person. Well, you are around me. But what about other people? I, I've been to enough funerals to say, that sucker, if anybody needs to die, he needed to die. <laughs> good riddance, man, I'll tell you. I've had to get up and preach behind someone get up a family member come in. Yeah, you're a bunch of hypocrites all sitting out. You didn't know him when he was alive. You didn't care to come to, to his house or even talk about him. Now you're a bunch of hypocrites. You're all sitting there. They were all bawling, crying. I was praying in tongues back there. Oh, get back up and say, well, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. That man's in heaven now. He don't have all these problems. You know, praise God. You got to learn to walk in the light as God's in the light, no matter what circumstances dictate. Your flesh is your flesh, and your flesh will still be your flesh until you leave this life. But if you'll learn to take your flesh and put it under submission to God and make it change, it will change. I used to smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. I haven't had a cigarette in 32 years. I smoked from the time I was eight till I was 30. Gone. Gone. Don't know why the heck I ever did that crazy stuff. Nasty. Drank, case of day, chasing with a fifth of scotch. Hadn't had a drop in 30 years, 33, 33 years. Why? Because God changed me. I submitted to his word, and I said, change me, God. Look, God will get in your face, and he'll tell you what you need to do. I don't have to. He will tell you if you seek him. I don't like that. Stop that. You don't have to have anybody but the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you, he will cause you to see the error of your way and change. God wants us to know and walk into his light as he's in that light. And as you and I walk in that light, remember, your flesh is an enemy to yourself. That's why he said, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil in you and he'll flee. You need to start realizing the devil knows every weakness you've got, and that's what he will always try to use against you. But God knows all his righteousness that he has in store for you, and he will yield it to you when you yield yours to him. Let's all stand. God is so good, and you know, I could teach for five to ten hours a day. Seven days a week. I love it. I don't care. I can do it in the grocery store. I can do it anywhere. I don't care where it's at because this stuff is life. The life we live is a life that Jesus did to bring his Father's kingdom into a reality realm. He said, look, search yourself and know where you're at. You don't have to be afraid of God. You don't have to sit there and say, man, God, I know Brother James got me all feeling horrible inside. I got all messed up in my head. I don't know what I'm doing. God says, that's okay. Give it up. 
If it bothers you that bad, give it up. Just give it up. Give it to God. Here, God, take this mess. I don't want it no more. And God says, wonderful. I've waited all this time to get that. Everybody say, Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. In Jesus' name, I am your child. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus, I thank you that you commissioned me to walk like you, to talk like you, to act like you, to be like you. I will not fail because you caused me to prevail. I surrender my flesh. I come out of the world. I separate myself to your glory, to your will, to your plan, to your purpose. It don't matter when I started. It matters I started. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. Thank you, Lord, for using me. Amen. Praise God. Tell someone you love me. You can be dismissed. Woo, woo, woo.